afternoon session started. So if I could ask everybody to try to sit uh, forward a little bit, like pick some of the front rows so that uh, even without a mic, we don't have to yell. So that would be great. <laughs> Nice community, right? <laughs> okay, so uh, this session, uh, uh, my name is Hua Jin Wang. My name is Hua Jin Wang. Uh, I was a biologist before, and uh, last year I joined the uh, university library here at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, so this session, we're going to talk about open tools uh, and platforms. Um, so our first speaker is uh, the Busby. <laughs> right there. So Ben is a data scientist and the genomics outreach coordinator at the NCBI. Uh, so for those those of you who have met Ben, you know that he's a very enthusiastic and very active in the uh, community of the scientific outreach. And some of you might have met him at the genomics meetup. Um, events, and some of you maybe will witness this uh, this evening at the scientific speed dating event. So, that please take it away. Hey everybody, my name is Ben Busby. I have 48 slides that I promised to get through in 12 minutes, so we're gonna go reasonably <laughs> fast. As soon as the slides actually come up, there they are. All right, so uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about genomics, because that's the area of the world that I primarily work in. That said, I think it illustrates an example of uh, a way data sharing can be done uh, in a lot of different scientific domains. Uh, so I work for NCBI, we house pretty much the world's biomedical literature, except preprints, which is pointed out earlier, is hosted in European Sea. Um, and uh, we're also the largest genomic database in the world. We have something like 14 petabytes of data. So I'm a big proponent of not wasting time. So in case the next 11 minutes mean nothing to you, uh, you probably use PubMed or PMC. So I just want to remind you that uh, you can use a website, you can create advanced searches, uh, and you can register for my NCBI account and have your searches done every week or month or whatever and email to you. Uh, but if you're in uh, sort of the API world, uh, we have an API called eUtils. There's a command line implementation called eDirect. And uh, you can Google for the eDirect cookbook. It's on GitHub. Uh, you can find uh, large bulk things very quickly. Uh, so that's kind of nice. You can put issues if you're having trouble coming up with things. Uh, you can actually locally cache your own version of PubMed or PMC, uh, the open access subset. It's really easy to get those now. Um, and then we've been experimenting, we built some prototypes uh, for corpus updaters for the PMC subset uh, if you're into natural language processing. So uh, you can get more information about that and literature done. Now let's talk about data. So um, in case you're not a sequence bioinformatician, uh, here's uh, uh, sequencing in 20 seconds. We use a long, short read or long read sequencer. Uh, we get reads and we either call variants uh, in the case of RNA-seq, we call expression, uh, or we assemble. Yeah. Anyway, um, so and we put stuff up metadata into cross-data type descriptors, so uh, you can search for things and then look at what particular data types are out there for your data of interest. Um, but how do you find data if metadata is insufficient? And this is one of the two main things I want to talk about today. One, uh, contextualized indexing of data. Two, getting out small data slices. So we've taxonomically indexed all of SRA by using KMERS. This is not a perfect way to taxonomically index, but it's really nice. If you're interested in some uh, funky family of viruses, now you can go to the SRA, which has millions of records, and find your funky family of viruses. So that's something uh, we've been very, very proud of. Uh, and you can go and you can say, I'm interested. I was at the City University of New York, and I said, uh, pick a virus, and somebody said herpes virus, right? Because everybody's interested in herpes virus. Uh, anyway, so they picked herpes virus, and they said, look at, let's look at some metagenomes uh, for a herpes virus. And this was the best educational moment of my life because there are 
Human herpes virus sequences on dollar bills in New York City. Uh, that was found data, I did not plan this. That was kind of amazing. And I want to come back to this, uh, because I think uh, it's important when we think about indexing. So, say I want to extract some data, right? So say I have some data, uh, and the metadata isn't horrible, but how do I extract the data? So, uh, I'm gonna go through this really fast, but we have this tool called Magic Blast. It doesn't really matter exactly what it is, but what it does, what it can do, is go into raw data sets and pull out exactly what you want, right? You're not moving the data. And that's really point number two of this whole talk. Don't move the big data sets. Extract what you want out of the big data sets. So how do I do that? Well, so I can just download a binary, and I need to find something to blast into. So say I'm interested in this uh, repressor in E. coli, then what I do is I go bioinformatics, 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 uh, bioinformatics, and now I have a sequence, right? So I make a BLAST database out of that, and then uh, this is really easy. Now, if you're not in the command line world, don't worry, there's this thing, software carpentry. You can get from where you are to right here in two days. Software carpentry is amazing. You have, if you're not in the command line world yet, you see a software carpentry course, you should sign up for it. It'll, it will change your life. Uh, and you'll get a better job. So anyway, um, so what you do is you just open up Magic Blast, it's color XDZF, come in, you make a Blast database out of your sequence, and you blast into it. But here's the cool thing. Here, I am streaming, I'm using this simple command to stream from the data set, right? So I'm streaming data, I'm not dumping data out of anywhere. And the really nice thing is it runs pretty quickly, so I can do this in a couple of minutes, but I really feel like I'm in the 21st century because I can do this on a plane. Uh, so that's a really exciting thing. By the way, FTP does not work on a plane, only HTTP. I can explain why later if people are interested. So anyway, so you can do this on a plane, and so we're streaming out of these huge uh, data sets, and we're only taking the little, we're only storing the little pieces that we want instead of dumping and making copies. And I think that's really important. And you get a uh, SAM file, which is, uh, for those of you who do genomics, kind of like uh, uh, the lingua franca of that. And it works with some other software. But here's a really nice thing. So we have the language bindings to be for anybody to build this into their software. So anybody uh, who does genomics work can build something on here, allowing their software to stream data out of large repositories. So um, that's something I'm particularly excited about. But wait. Imagine we could take this and build an index of all virus sequences, right? Known virus sequences, virus sequences related to families, and novel viruses that are in metagenomes in the SRA. So we have about a million metagenomic samples in the SRA, right? So say we could build indexes like this, so you know where the herpes virus is in your environment, right? And that joke is just not working. I'm going to stop using it. Uh, anyway, so... So we started building this pipeline. And so, uh, actually, this was built by a guy named uh, Paul Cantalupo and some others uh, in Pittsburgh, actually, the first step. Uh, and we built this really simple De Bruyne grapher to discover, discover novel viruses. I won't talk about that too much. Um, wrapped it in Python. And then here, uh, we can discover novel viruses. We can discover friends of viruses. And we can also discover exact viruses, like I showed you earlier. And we built all of those things in Hackathon. So, what we're going to do this spring is have data analysis hackathons where uh, we're able to actually index a whole bunch of different data types. So we're going to index viruses out of a million metagenomes. We're going to index RNA-seq. We're going to index haplotypes. We're going to index variants, a bunch of other things. Um, and by the way, we're able to give everybody credit for all these projects by using osf.io. So just a, a shout out to them. I think there's somebody from them here. So uh, here are some upcoming hackathons. There will be many, many of these data analysis hackathons as well as tool building hackathons in the spring. Uh, so that's something to keep an eye out for. Um, and so in December and January, we are going to build an index of viruses. And then we'll start working on uh, RNA-seq and antimicrobial resistance data. So uh, what does building an index allow us to do? So if we have an index that everybody can more or less agree on, then we can point back to data sets 
in situ and we no longer have to ETL them. So it doesn't matter if they're on a big uh, data set in the cloud, it doesn't matter if they're on somebody's sort of local front facing server, it doesn't matter where the data sets are. And here's the thing, most people just want the knowledge anyway, they don't actually want the raw data. Should that raw data be available? Yes. How fast should it be available? That's a discussion for the last panel. But um, anyway, I think that is the value of indexing. We're also going to try uh, to work on contextualized ways uh, to think about the metadata. Um, and uh, to harken back to one of the previous presentations, uh, the most irreverent thing we've ever done in a hackathon is build SRA Tinder, because some data sets are crappy. Uh, and I sent this team uh, your framework thing earlier. So, uh, yeah, so because some data sets are crappy, and so you should be able to eliminate data sets you don't want uh, when you're streaming small bits of data out of large repositories. Uh, so that's it, and I'm happy to take any questions. It's just a it's just a practical question. Can you put up the slide share? Uh, you had a URL but for downloading the slides. Somewhere. Oh yeah, absolutely. Could you put that up so that because there were a lot of them. I, <laughs> I totally can. That, that was like a basic primer on how to use NCBI. Uh, so, yeah, check that out. So the slides are going to be shared uh, after the conference, right? With, the, with speaker's permissions, of course. Yeah. Yeah, so I, the, the issue of crappy meta, metadata, is this something that you guys are working? Is this something that you guys are working to kind of legislate? Sort of the royal you guys with NCBI? Is this something you think is going to be driven by communities? But in my field of bacterial genomics, it's a, it's a big problem with, with just uh, you know, no or, or crappy metadata, which makes, makes a proper reuse and, and use uh, a real challenge. So first, uh, everything I'm about to say is my personal opinion and not the opinion of the NIH. Second, uh, legislate is a very specific term uh, that has to do with Congress, who is almost certainly not going to do anything about bacterial genomics metadata. Uh, so, I finally told the joke. Uh, anyway, uh, so so it's it is a massive issue, and and I think there are two ways to approach the metadata issue, and one is through harmonization, natural language processing. Uh, two, and this is my, there are three ways. Two, and this is my personal opinion, if the NIH wanted people to submit reusable data, R01 renewals would be based on how much the data was reused, right? Again, my personal opinion. Uh, so, so the Office of Extramural Research uh, really should base part of the renewal funding on that. Um, and third, I think there is some hope for making a metadata out of data and by some of these indexing things. And, and I'll give you a specific example from bacterial genomics. So what we can do is we can take raw fast cues that come off Illumina sequencers and make context, right? Based on context, we can decorate them from do with domains, but more specifically, we can look at antimicrobial resistance genes, right? When we look at antimicrobial resistance genes, we can index which of our approximately uh, four million bacterial data sets have specific antimicrobial resistance genes. So what we've done in that sense is we've been able to make an index of, of the bacterial resistance genes that actually came out of the data. So, and then we can go back and contextualize that and say, oh, okay, so these people said it was at this specific latitude and longitude and, and try to improve the metadata based on uh, based on the metadata we've extracted out of the data. Yeah? yeah? So so those are a whole bunch of approaches, some of which, the last one, I have a little bit of control over, and the rest of which I don't have a whole lot of control over. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, thank you, super. All right, thank you. So we'll, we can save other questions for uh, the panel. Yeah. Thank you. Is 
So Sean is a senior associate scientist at the Center of the Cancer Research at, uh, national, uh, at the National Cancer Institute. Uh, so actually, uh, Sean, uh, when, he, when he was uh, young, he did a summer school in Pittsburgh. So he loved Pittsburgh so much so that he decided to do his PhD and uh, MD here at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, afterwards, I guess he moved to uh, NCI, and from there on, he did a lot of uh, great things in the bioinformatics and data analysis. Um, so we're really glad you're back in Pittsburgh and uh, giving a speech to us. Um, and by the way, uh, he's going to uh, also uh, speak, talk about teach a bioconductor workshop too. So thanks for the invitation. Uh, I walked past this building every day for like six years. And um, that little summer school thing, this is rumor, but I'm gonna tell you the story anyway. There was, there was a group that was uh, assigned, uh, one of the sister groups on campus at the same time, was assigned to figure out whether the tiles in this building were radioactive enough that you couldn't lean against them. So um, this building does have some history and some age to it, obviously, when you walk around. But in any case, um, I'm gonna talk about the cancer data ecosystem, um, data and cloud resources for cancer data science. So this is um, uh, gonna focus a little bit on the cancer data side of things, but I wanna, want everybody to think about this as a data ecosystem that um, is developing in a way that I think a lot of us would like to see our own ecosystem, data ecosystems develop. Slides are a uh, bit.ly link at the bottom. Here's the NIH, people ask me where do you work, what does it look like, uh, that's it, that's the clinical center, it's the largest hospital on earth devoted to biomedical research. Believe it, believe me, it's huge. Um, I don't work in that building, but. Uh, uh, quickly, I'm gonna give an overview of the NCI Cancer Research Data Commons. Um, it's a, a, a mouthful, CRDC, you'll hear me call it. It's an API-driven, open, and fair data platform for cancer research. Um, I'm gonna focus a little bit on a specific hub for a specific node, the um, Genomic Data Commons. Uh, like Ben, uh, I have a genomic focus, but NCI has a lot of approaches, or a lot of data sets that follow the same sort of tack that you're gonna see here. And then finally, I'll talk a little bit about um, intro to uh, cancer genomic resources, in, in, in particular, cloud-based genomics, um, and, and using cloud for cancer research. Cancer uh, genomic data challenges, um, as of now, there are actually, this is a little bit old, uh, three petabytes of, uh, of uh, data associated with uh, cancer uh, that NCI hosts centrally. Um, there used to be fragmentary uh, repositories uh, that hosted these data in various pieces. It was hard to find things because they weren't in one place, and they were annotated <coughs> meta metadata, and actually the data were processed differently. Um, so assuming that a two, two and a half or three pet, ter, uh, petabyte uh, data set's available, what would you need to use, on, use it? Well, you would need $2 million worth of storage if you wanted to host it yourself, and you would need about um, 23 days with a 10 gigabit connection to download it all. So most places don't want to do that anymore, and um, we, so we've, NCI's been thinking about <coughs> approaches for uh, getting around that. All of this is sort of couched in uh, things that we've current fair data uh, principles, fair guiding principles. Um, and the NCI Cancer Research Data Commons has a, a particular sort of vision. Uh, it's to create a data science infrastructure that's necessary to connect repositories, analytical tools, and knowledge bases. Now, I would argue that this is a fairly, um, this is actually too uh, limited a scope, um, but I think we can, I'll, I'm gonna show that uh, we can actually extend the scope uh, a little bit without having to uh, have NCI do extra work. So data intensive cancer research, you can think of it in, in uh, this sort of uh, nodes and edges diagram. If you think of each of those uh, nodes uh, as either a data resource or an analysis resource, the way that we interconnect those things is through edges, and those edges are typically described these days as APIs. So if we have APIs and we have a, a description of what those APIs are able to do uh, with respect to either data or uh, analysis, we can actually build fairly large pipelines or very large and complicated uh, research infrastructures without having to do anything locally. I'll show an example of that in a minute. So the genomic data commons. All data science starts with data. Um, so we have to generate it, and then more importantly, have to, we have to make it findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. 
Um, the the uh, Genomic Data Commons is really designed to do a few different things. It's to unify uh, fragmentary data repositories, put, put everything in one place. It harmonizes data and metadata uh, with existing, with, for, across existing and new cancer research programs and projects. That's a, an upside, that is we get good um, metadata and data. It's a downside because as of right now, the Genomic Data Commons contains only 40 projects. And NCI probably generates about a thousand or more uh, data sets per year. So the reason there are only 40 in there is because it takes months to do to uh, develop a data model associated with a new data set. This is the 40 projects. Uh, there are uh, 33,000 or so, actually it's about 40,000 now cases, individual patients data. Um, and uh, it's now up around 500,000 files. <coughs> These are all uh, metadata, uh, uh, annotated and findable. This is what a website um, to find the data looks like. Uh, there's essentially two ways to enter the data, either files or cases. Uh, if you want to start with files, this is I'm looking for a certain type of BAM file or a certain type of file associated with a certain assay um, or cases. I want uh, uh, patients of, uh, who have breast cancer who are under 35. Uh, you marry those two as a query and you get back a subset of either cases or files or both. This is all driven by an API. And the API is, uh, is driven by the underlying data model. Each of those block, or each of those, um, those circles over there, you can think of as um, a relational table in a database. So it, to describe just the metadata, this is now not the data, just the metadata associated with all the information in the genomic data commons, you have to fill out each of, those, or each of those tables for each entity. And those are all interconnected, of course. So the, the, that data model then allows us to um, query into it using an API and to get the inter interconnectivity um, between these different entities. And essentially, to find the file or case that you want. You can build on top of this API an NCI <laughs> uh, uh, data browsers, um, data discovery tools, etc. But even though NCI spends quite a bit of money, I won't tell you the number because I don't know exactly what it is, but it's at least six digits or more, um, you can get these kinds of things. But what happens if there's something here that you don't, that doesn't do, if there's nothing that NCI is built that does what you want? Well, the cancer data ecosystem is extensible. And we can leverage this open data concept of nodes and edges, APIs, um, and the interoperability, and interoperability to enhance data value. How many of you have heard of Bioconductor? All right, that's Bioconductor. It's, uh, it's about 1,400 software packages for um, understanding and interpreting uh, high throughput uh, biology, high throughput biologic data. So if we can marry the tools and the developer community and the user community, it's around half a million users, if we can marry those, the, those folks with the data that are in the genomic data commons, we expose those data in the genomic data commons to a much larger research community than if we just relied on them, on people finding a particular tool that's already built for them. So uh, early on, I built a, a package called the Genomic Data Commons package for Bioconductor. It does something very simple. It just talks to the API uh, in, in uh, the Genomic Data Commons, the NCI Genomic Data Commons. So to give a really quick uh, example, we want to explore the somatic variants, the variants that are, that are specific to the tumor in patients in a melanoma cohort. And we want to do this in a reproducible, use, reusable way using Bioconductor. We want to go from pointing and clicking on a website to this. But we want to do that reproducibly. Well, Unless we're taking screenshots of, of all the pointing and clicking we're doing, it's not reproducible when we do it on a website. So let's write some code. Starting from this, this is API. If I click a box here, that's the, essentially the same as doing a filter, filtering the data in, in Bioconductor. So I start with files, the square box. This is the code to be able to do what I just showed, that to be able to make the plot that I just showed. Start with files. We're gonna uh, select uh, melanoma. This is what that looks like in, in code. Cases, project, project ID, and this TCGA melanoma data set. 
masks somatic mutation, mutec 2 variant aggregation and masking, and a math file. Three more filters in code, written down, easy to see. It's actually fairly easy to understand. Um, for those of you who use dplyr, it uh, works very much like dplyr. We get one file, the IDs uh, code, pulls back the ID for that file. It's a universally unique ID, so we can actually share that with people. And then finally, we download the file. One, uh, one block of code, it's actually only one uh, expression in R, <coughs> goes through all that um, the filtering on the website and gets us the data. We use a, a package already built into Bioconductor called MathTools. Two more lines, actually it's three more lines because I left out the plot. Three more lines of code gets us this. So with about 10 lines, we've entirely reproducibly uh, uh, gotten data from uh, actually the largest NCI repository um, and uh, in a fully reproducible way made a plot. If the data happened to change, we rerun the, we rerun the code and we get new data, or we get a new plot. So that's all fine and good if we, uh, if we want to stick to uh, data sets that are downloadable, uh, that is processed data sets that are downloadable. We're obviously moving to a place where um, uh, we want to be able to share uh, our knowledge and that knowledge may actually be in very large scale uh, workflows and pipelines. So we want to collaborate at scale. And a lot of people talk about cloud computing uh, because you don't want to download the data, because it's scalable. My argument is that um, cloud computing uh, enables something that we haven't been able to do up to this point, which is collaboration at scale um, without much work. So uh, reproducible, reproducibility, reusability, collaboration without borders. That's what we're going for. Team science here is critical. Our teams, as we've heard, I think every talk this morning, the teams are not in your lab anymore. They're spread across the world. Um, there's a, a nice talk or a nice uh, paper recently by Ben Langmead uh, on this topic. And he comes to the conclusion, cloud's elasticity, reproducibility, and privacy features make it ideally suited for this kind of work. We're moving away from this model of uh, this, this local compute storage, which uh, silos our science, not just our data, our science, um, and moving toward a situation where uh, we have this uh, cloud computing capability with data, <coughs> workflows, um, and uh, security built in. Uh, there are three cloud resources that enable this kind of technology. Here's what one looks like. And I'll, you really can't read it, but at the top left there are projects. Projects in, in this, uh, in this uh, platform are uh, shareable. So all I need is your email, and I can share this, this project with you, no matter if it has two files or 10,000. Workflows are also shareable. Accessing, uh, the links are here. You can get access to this if you sign up. It takes about 15 seconds. You'll get $300 worth of credits. Um, and if you run a, a small RNA-seq uh, analysis using one of the newer uh, rna tools, uh, it's about 10 cents per sample. So uh, $300 will get you 3,000 samples or something. So There are a lot of challenges. I'm not gonna read through them. Um, uh, one of the biggest ones that, uh, that I wanna highlight is uh, data ownership and valuation. So we, there was a lot of discussion this morning about who owns the data and what's its value. Uh, we know that it's very valuable. Frankly, we don't know who owns it. Uh, even if people have consented, uh, we don't know exactly who owns it. So those are, those are open questions. Uh, uh, but in any case, things are moving forward and uh, uh, we're learning as we go. Links of potential interest, and then finally my contact information. But thanks. Any questions for Sean? Hello, um, it was a great talk, thank you very much. I have a question about the bioconductor package you showed. So the first a technical question. The data are being downloaded directly from the NIH website that you showed us, right? Um, it seems to me that that's a little bit fragile to URLs changing over time to the NIH's infrastructure over time. So like in the challenges you face, like what sort of solutions are you envisioning for this kind of independent fragility? 
Yeah, so, so um, th these days, um, APIs, if they're written correctly, are, are, discover are, are self-discoverable. That is, if you have, if you have a URL, um, you should be able to discover, and that's exactly what happens here. I, don't, I haven't written um, code that is specific to the API. I discover the API every time that I start the package. And, and good APIs are written that way for exactly that reason, so that uh, we're not talking about um, uh, uh, not being able to change an API over time. In terms of the URL, yes, if that changes, then we're, the social contract is broken. Uh, and that's actually happened once with the genomic data comments. Uh, so uh, in that case, we, uh, I, I have to change my software, and I write a nasty email to the genomic data comments people saying, hey, <laughs> don't do that again without telling those of us who are using this uh, at, at, at an, on an industrial scale what you're doing. That's a communication problem uh, that uh, software developers need to uh, uh, work on over time. <laughs> Thank you, Sean, for this wonderful talk. So our next speaker, pull out the slides. So uh, our next speaker, uh, Eden uh, Gatank, he's a, a senior data wrangler from the uh, ENCODE uh, Data Coordination Center. Uh, so ENCODE has uh, done a lot of uh, wonderful work to uh, work on the developing uh, pipe, uh, computational pipelines uh, to make reproduci uh, reproducible analysis for the, uh, um, for the DNA uh, data uh, and for uh, DNA elements and data curation. So I'm going to let, let him tell you more about it. First, I'd like to thank the organizer for uh, inviting me and letting me uh, present the ENCODE project at this <coughs> scientific meeting. Uh, allow me to start from asking you to imagine that you are provided with a map that gives you a location of a treasure um, that is out somewhere with this uh, red X. So I imagine that you as uh, true treasure hunters will go there and try to find the treasure and Surprise, surprise, you will see a huge rock uh, exactly at the place that is uh, mentioned on the map. And since you have a huge rock, probably you cannot access the treasure that is under the rock. And let's imagine further that you were able to somehow move the rock and discover a cave underneath. Does it really mean that you now have the treasure in hand once you enter the cave? Well. Obviously not, because the cave may be full with dangerous creatures that uh, will prevent you from getting the treasure. What I'd like to say is that even if you provide access to the location where the treasure is, you know uh, not always will be able to get the treasure. Similarly, if you have open access to data, so you have some scientific resources that you can access, it not always means that you will be able to use the resource, and not always you will be able to find the data, even if the data is there. And that happens uh, frequently since the implementation of the resource was unfair, not the principles that were used to, uh, to call the, the database were not uh, following the fair principles. And that brings me to the uh, ENCO project and the way we implement our database and how we try to make it really useful to the scientific community. Uh, I would like to first start from shortly, short introduction to the ENCODE project itself. I'm not sure how many people here know what ENCODE project is. Okay, so, so for the benefit of those of you who doesn't, ENCODE stands for Encyclopedia of DNA Elements. It's a project that was initiated more or less right after the human genome was sequenced. 
And the main goal of the project is to identify all the functional elements of the human genome. Um, during the pilot phase uh, in 2003, the target was 1% of the human genome being investigated. And in the second phase of the, of the project, the Data Coordination Center was established and was in uh, UCSC. And it was integrated with the genome browser that anybody that does genomics probably knows about. <coughs> Um, in the third phase, the data coordination center moved to Stanford, and more or less at, at, at that time, um, there was a huge overhaul of all the way we treat the data and the way we envision people using this resource. <laughs> and project manager at that time, Yui Hong, envisioned that as a Zappos for genomic community. So we wanted to create a site that will allow you to find your data as easy as, as to find a pair of shoes on Zappos. <laughs> and, and the way to do it was to create a pretty sophisticated data model. All the uh, metadata is captured in JSON objects. Uh, we provide RESTful API for submission and uh, querying the database. And once we've done that, we started to get a huge amount of data which we realized pretty fast that it needs to be treated in a specific way to allow this data to be really comparable and to allow integrative analysis in there. To, to address those issues, we um, established uniform processing pipelines using the Nexus platform at the time. And those, those pipelines are available even today if you want to analyze your, your data using those pipelines. And now we find ourselves in the uh, fourth phase of the project. We have, in addition to the production labs that generate a lot of genomics data using common assets such as ChIP-seq, RNA-seq, uh, chia pet, DNAs, etc., we have added functional characterization centers. Their goal is to take predicted functional elements and to really try to test them and characterize them and, and to tell to give us experimental evidence for the functionality of those elements. In addition to the, to addition, in, in addition to the functional characterization groups, uh, we have rethought all our uh, approach to the pipelines, and the new pipelines that we're implementing are done using a framework that incorporates Docker technology and allows you to uh, take your tool that you would like to use to analyze the data, containerize it, and make it really portable and reproducible uh, and independent of any platform where you would like to use this tool. The ENCODE project currently consists of more than 20 labs all over the uh, country, and all the data that is generated by those labs is submitted to the Data Coordination Center in Stanford. And the the job of Data Coordination Center is to facilitate submission from, from the labs to the Coordination Center, review and curate the data, communicate back to the lab the results of this curation and review, and then refine the data, and this process is iterative, and only when the lab and us in the Data Coordination Center are satisfied with the results, the data is shared to the scientific community and also submitted to other genomic resources. Now, as I pointed out, our job is to, uh, to make sure that the data that gets published is of high quality. So when the data comes from the lab to the Encode Data Coordination Center, we apply pretty high standards on the data, and only data that passes those standards, and, and by standards I mean both on the level of the data itself and on the level of the metadata that is submitted, only then the data is uh, successfully accepted and uh, released to public. Currently, the ENCODE portal hosts data not only from the ENCODE project, but also from uh, additional projects, such as RMC, GGR, modern and modern code data. We have more than 50,000 experiments, almost 50 types of different assays, and uh, more than 60, 640 terabytes of data files. Now, as I pointed, Earlier, when you have 
this amount of data and you want to make integrative analysis, you have to ensure that uh, it will be uh, comparable and reducible. So we gather all the metadata in JSON format. We establish a data model to accommodate those things. We, since it's a lot of data, we provide programmatic access both for submission and for download. And the data uh, ends up on the cloud. Recently, we have added the ability to access data files directly in the cloud without the need to download them uh, locally. The metadata that we track uh, is really diverse and we have a lot of end reach. Here you, have see, you can see a handful of examples of objects. Each of those objects will contain multiple properties that will be filled in when the data is submitted. All the data is bound together using ontologies that make um, identification of types of samples unambiguous. They allow us to group the data and facilitate search of data. Um, and we have to maintain this uh, balance between asking for a lot of metadata but not too much because it, uh, we obviously understand that it makes life of the submitters very difficult if we require a lot of metadata. But due to the fact that we collect all this metadata, we can track provenance from result file back to the donor that was uh, giving the sample that was tested in some experiment. So from the fixed file, you can go to the alignments, from alignments to the eats that were generated in the sequencer, to the library that was produced in the lab, sample, antiweight that was used, and back to the donor. Um, to allow comparable integrative results and to ensure reproducibility, in the third phase, we have developed those uniform processing pipelines <coughs> on the DNA Nexus platform. And since the uh, Docker technology was introduced and is uh, such a success, and using the experience that we gained working with those pipelines in the third phase of the project, we moved on to uh, establishing a Python development framework that is based on Docker, Widdle, and Cromwell technologies. Um, if you are interested to learn more about this framework, you um, are welcome for my workshop tomorrow. And with that, I would like to thank the DCC members that work so hard making this resource possible. And it's your for funding and you for your attention. Questions for Eden? No questions? So So I have a uh, question, like, with the, how is, like, so, so this is, like, community data being submitted, like, into, like, this data coordination center. It's, how do you? It's not a community data. It's not. So, Ampot is a consortium that is funded by the NSGRI, and also labs that are funded that really produce the data we have, what we call mapping centers that generate data from genomic assays and run functional fertilization centers that generate functional fertilization data. We do work and plan to allow community submissions, but so far, the vast majority of the data on the portal is from labs that belong to the Emperor Consortium. Thank you. Yeah, you, uh, you showed that you have the data on the cloud and that you have computational pipelines on the cloud. And one thing that I'm curious is, are you collecting data on how people are using these, these data? Do you have a sense that people are actually going in there and computing on the cloud, or are they going in there and downloading to their machines locally that they need? I'm just using some index, indexing tricks like we saw before, and, and then doing that all the way. So what's your sense? Sure. So first of all, the data that is on the cloud and the public access to the data 
is a recent development that so we don't have really any sense of how much people started to use that because it's really very, very recent. About the use of the pipelines and use of the data, once we introduced this framework with the pipelines in the Weedle Docker format, we got a lot of uh, communication from the users that started to use those pipelines and report different bugs, issues, questions, etc. So that's reassuring that people really are using those pipelines and we're really happy to get feedback and improve those pipelines. And in terms of statistics of, on general use of data and access of data, uh, we have them, but I'm not, like, I cannot offhand give you numbers. Yeah, I did the context of this is, at least for the human connector project, which is a big data collection of the human MRI data, I've heard people say that the data is available on the cloud, but usually what people go is they go in there, they download it to some disk drive locally and install it instead of using it on the cloud, as it was intended. I'm just curious if that will play out. Right, I, I fully understand that, but I don't think it's feasible to download uh, hundreds of terabytes of data to the local computer. You can have hundreds of terabytes. It's right, right. And then, and then <laughs> the other thing is that we believe that the future is in the cloud and people will, well, I believe that people will move the computer to the cloud and when the computer is in the cloud, it's convenient to use the compute. Move the compute to your data, do your calculation and get the results and not move the data to the I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about how you came up with the standards. Like if they were sort of industry-wide or you just made them up you know, at, in, at ENCODE or whether they're sort of universal standards. When you say standards, which standards do we refer? One in your diagram between the data and the release. Okay, so there are two, well, I would say that there are, there are two different groups of standards. One is metadata standards and one is data standards. So by the data standards, I mean to be a high quality RNA-seq experiment, you need certain read depth or coverage or, or any other metric that uh, scientific community decided <coughs> as the valid uh, high quality experiment. And, and to decide upon those numbers or metrics, we have working group within the consortia that are debating and deciding on those values. And what we in the Data Protection Center are doing, we are applying the standards. So the decision is made in the working groups. We are applying and then presenting that to the user. So the user that goes to the certain experiment will, will get clear uh, badge saying this experiment uh, has this and that read depth, which does or does not comply with standards. That's one group of standards. The other group is metadata standards, and those are dictated by us. And basically, the idea here is to establish data model that will allow us to curate the data, that it will allow us to present the data in a way that will be useful to the users, and facilitate search if any of the uh, specifications on the objects that people submit is not fulfilled and that jeopardizes our ability to fulfill our mission, we are going to, to block the submission and require uh, specifics. Another, I would say that it also belongs to the metadata standards is validation of input. So uh, you cannot really assume that, for instance, files that are submitted to the resource contain exactly the format that is claimed to be submitted, simply because when you're talking about hundreds of thousands of files, inevitably some mistake will happen and somebody will submit instead of FASP file, XML file, and nobody will know about that because nobody checks that. So we do apply a rigorous checking of those things, trying to validate every single thing that is submitted that it really what it claims to be. Okay, thank you, Eden. Thank if there's no further questions, we'll move on to the next speaker.
same no parent. All right, okay. Oh. Right, thank you. So, our last speaker, uh, Ariel Renko, he's a, a senior data scientist at the uh, University of Washington E Science Institute. And he has a passion for analysis and sharing the uh, large scale open data set and facilitate the So thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, it's, it's really interesting to hear all these things. Um, the, the slides for this presentation are on, on that website, so you can go and see the slides. There are links to some of the references and so on. I've also tweeted out this link so you don't have to hurry up and, and copy it. Um, so I, I work as a data scientist at something called the eScience Institute at the University of Washington. We're the main hub for data science activities at the University of Washington, and that means we do Several different, we have several different arms of what we do. A lot of what we do are um, community building activities. We have a data science studio, which is a main space that's where we work and where others can come and work with us where we do events and programs and um, host working groups and so on. Uh, we do take part in education all the way from degree options and courses uh, to various kinds of workshops. I'll, I'll talk about one particular workshop towards the end of my talk. And then we do research uh, both in the development of data science methods applications of these methods in particular research domains and, um, and then write open source software. And my talk today will be about open source software specifically for neuroimaging. I'm a, I'm a neuroscientist and I'm particularly interested in uh, brain connectivity and parts of the, of the brain that connect between different parts. And we've known for a very long time that brain connectivity is really important for a variety of different uh, functions. Uh, these are 19th century uh, neurologists and they figured that out by looking at, at patients who had certain disconnectivities brain. So here's, here's the white matter, this is a postmortem brain, and you're looking at these large scale connections between different parts of the brain, and that's, that's what I'm interested in. And we have many different ways of, of looking at that experimentally, um, ooh, except we can't see them here, um, so I'll just skip forward. Um, we have many different kinds of experiments that we can do, there are many different methods. Um, and traditionally, the cycle has been that we've been able to collect this data, analyze it, interpret it, and then feed that back into additional experiments that we're doing. But neuroscience is undergoing a kind of a shift from a um, single lab doing their experiments at small scale to also include a different model of, of knowledge production, which is more similar to these observatory-driven science uh, projects. Uh, um, of course, there are pro projects, I think, in code project that is also kind of an observatory. Many projects in genomics are actually like that. The examples I have here are from uh, fields that are, are a bit further away even from, from neuroscience. Um, so, you know, the, uh, the astronomy uh, sky surveys that produce very large amounts of data and distribute that to the community and the uh, energy physics uh, here, the, the large Hadron Collider. And also uh, that community produces, uh, develops very large instruments, collects lot, lots of data and that produces this data in a way that, that the community can analyze. So we're moving to this kind of observatory-driven science where once we had to do individual experiments in, in different labs, and uh, there are several examples of, of new brain observatories that are coming to mind. So the Allen Institute for Brain Science is a brain observatory. They actually use the term brain observatory to refer to one of their uh, uh, big experiments that they're doing. Uh, the Human Connectome Project is a big brain observatory that has been going on for quite a while now, and has collected MRI, high-quality MRI data from uh, over a thousand individuals. And these, these uh, brain observatories keep growing in, in orders of magnitude. The Healthy Brain Network from the Child Mind Institute will collect, ultimately collect 10,000 brains. Uh, I believe you've seen some of this data uh, earlier today in Anisha's talk. And then um, there are other projects with similar goals, collecting also around uh, 10,000. I think they've actually, the ABCD uh, project has now reached more than 10,000 uh, subjects that we collected. And the UK Biobank will eventually collect them too. So half a million subjects. And we'll all have uh, high quality MRI data from multiple individuals, and that gives a lot of opportunities for research. We, these new data sets will enable important new discoveries. For example, in the, in the UK Biobank, there'll be such a big amount of, of individuals that we can, uh, we can just by the probabilities, we can, we can guess that there would be hundreds of individuals who during the time of the study will convert to Alzheimer's. So we'll have a view on a fairly large cohort of people converting into Alzheimer's just by virtue of the large number of was collected. And that's a new kind of data set. It's very different from the kinds of data sets we've collected before. So that allows us to do what we think of data as data-driven data discovery. 
Dr. Slavin you know, mentioned you know, the, the fourth paradigm of science. This is the fourth paradigm data driven discovery. Um, but there are challenges that come with that uh, data arriving at these unprecedented volume, and variety, and velocity. Uh, we need new tools and we need a, new approaches to process, analyze, interpret these data. Uh, and we need to think of new socio-technical structures to sustain the, these kinds of data science approaches to these data. Uh, now that we work as, more as a community of consumers of data, we need to think about how we organize ourselves. Maybe more similar to the way that the astronomers and the uh, uh, high energy physicists organize themselves. Um, and I think one thing that is becoming clear is that open source software, or software in general, is a necessary complement to these data. We need to produce the software that will analyze these data, and we need to organize ourselves around these, these software projects. So one, one approach to this is open source software for science. Um, I uh, fall strongly on the side of, of choosing Python as an ecosystem for scientific computing, and I'll argue for that uh, next. Um, first of all, it's free, it's open source, so anyone can use it on any platform that they choose to use it. Uh, it's a high-level interpreted language, so you don't need a computer science degree in order to pick it up and start using it uh, uh, quite effectively. Uh, there's very wide adoption of, of Python, both in industry and in academia, and that's important. For example, in astronomy, again, going to astronomy, uh, here the, the astronomers have these, uh, uh, this collection of, of the, the literature in astronomy that you can mine, and so you can uh, look at uh, mentions of software, and you can see that Python is, uh, has been rising steadily uh, even though other, other kinds of software, mentions of other kinds of software also have been rising, they haven't quite been doing it as, as quite the same rate. So uh, astronomy is sort of adopting Python quite uh, heavily. Um, why are they adopting it? What's the, what's the benefit? Well, let's think about sort of the ecosystem that exists around it. So there's Python, the language itself. Um, and over the years, people have developed around Python um, various tools to work with, with data, NumPy and SciPy, sort of basic uh, numerical computing tools. Um, over the years, people developed other tools for interactive work, plotting, uh, and, and interactive computation, uh, map model of Jupiter. Um, and for this uh, sort of beginning ecosystem, people started building uh, sort of, uh, domain agnostic tools for machine learning, for high performance computing, for image processing, and so on. And, and people took these tools and built on top of them tools for particular uh, domains, BioPython for biology, AstroPies in, in, in astronomy, and then um, the, the, the sort of core of what I'll talk about today is NiPy is neuroimaging in Python. And so there are several different projects and they're, they're, they're all stem out of this, but others in neuroscience have also picked this up. So now the, the Allen Institute, for example, is developing also Python software for their tools. And in, in, the, in parallel, people in industry realize the value of data science and using Python for data science. And so uh, tools that uh, industry uh, um, companies are, are developing for in this case, high performance computing or for deep learning are also sitting on top of an API in Python. So there's a lot of value to that. And through the Jupyter project, we can easily interact with other open source um, languages like R and like Julia. So this whole ecosystem uh, becomes a really strong foundation for uh, work in uh, open source uh, science. Um, and what's nice about this is it's a network of interactions so we can learn from each other as we work. So NiPy is, as I said, stands for Neuroimaging Python. And really, uh, the way to think about NiPy is not so much as a, a project, but more of a community of practice. A community of practice is a very loosely knit uh, uh, aggregation of many different projects and individuals who try to learn from each other about the work that different people are doing within a, a certain domain. Uh, the focus is on, on commons, so these are uh, common resources, shared resources that are maintained collectively and available to anyone. So many of these tools that are developed through this community are not owned by any particular lab. Rather, they're uh, open resources that are open both for use and also for contribution. I'll, I'll show you a little bit of that. Uh, so back to the white matter, what I'm interested in, I'll focus in even more on a particular project that uh, focuses on diffusion MRI. So th these data, diffusion MRI data, um, are a way for us to measure the motion of water in particular uh, parts of the brain. Um, Water moves around, diffuses around in, inside of cells, and if you're in a place like this that has round boundaries, then you might get uh, equal diffusion in all directions, and we call that isotropic diffusion. But if you're in one of these cables that I showed you before that connect between different parts of the brain, you might get more diffusion along the length of the, the axons, along the length of these uh, cables, than across these boundaries, and that's called anisotropic diffusion. And uh, we can use diffusion MRI in order to derive uh, measurements and statistics of 
the, the degree of anisotropy. So we can get a measurement of, of, or an estimate of how much diffusion there is in particular locations. So we were looking at a slice through, uh, a horizontal slice through a brain, and we can measure, we can see that in these holes, these ventricles in the middle of the brain, there's more diffusion than in the, in the core of the white matter. And we can estimate uh, how much anisotropy there is, how directional is the diffusion in a particular location, and that's called fractional anisotropy. And we can even uh, say in what direction is the principal diffusion direction. We can use that in order to track uh, major uh, fiber bundles, major, major tracks in the brain. So um, we have software that, that can do that. And for example, if we focus on some particular track in the brain, we might connect that to, uh, let's say, a disease. So for example, now we're looking at these uh, big tracks. These are the corticospinal tracks on both sides uh, that connect the, the brain to the spinal cord and, and control motor activity. Um, and in uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, ALS, it's a Lou Gehrig's disease, uh, we can see that uh, patients have lower FA, this is this de degree of anisotropy, in some parts of the corticospinal tract relative to, to healthy control. So we can, we can really look at the biology underlying uh, a disorder using this uh, diffusion. And so uh, DiPi is a project that focuses on open source diffusion MRI. It's one of those projects within DiPi. So if you think of the broader ecosystem, I'm now zoomed in all the way. And I, I work on this, on this project together. Uh, Lathiris Garifalidis, who's at Indiana University, is, of this project, we actually recently got uh, support from the NIH through a grant uh, to develop and disseminate this, uh, this project. Um, and it's open to users. Here we just show that a lot of people download this and use this. We know that people use it in various places. But more importantly, it's open to contributions. So people can uh, show up and, and, and talk to us and contribute their code. We've had several co contributions from uh, Google Summer of Code uh, students that have participated in this project. And we've had contributions from a variety of different places. That's sort of the power of this open collaborations that we can capitalize on a large community of contributors. Uh, there are challenges for this kind of initiative uh, or these kinds of uh, initiatives. Sustainability is one kind of problem. Uh, assuring that the quality is high is another kind of problem. Um, there, I'll just mention two kinds of uh, uh, um, initiatives that try to address these. Uh, IRSI is the US Research Software Sustainability Institute. This institute doesn't exist yet, but there is a conceptualization project uh, funded by the NSF that will establish eventually, hopefully, an institute for software sustainability, similar to software sustainability institutes that exist in other countries. Uh, so you should uh, uh, keep an eye on this. And then another kind of initiative that I'm involved in is the Journal of Open Source Software. So if you write software, uh, this is an, an opportunity to submit your software uh, in short format, just a sh short uh, paper about your software, and have the software itself be reviewed uh, for uh, its, its rigor. And it provides canonical citation. Um, and then, uh, given that I'm short on time, I'm just going to skip ahead a little bit past this. Okay, so at this, at this point, I'm just going to mention one more uh, thing. Um, you might ask, uh, ask yourself, if you're a neuroscientist and you're doing neuroscience, uh, how do you get involved in this kind of community? I'll just mention one thing that we do annually that I think is a, is a good opportunity to get involved, um, which is a summer institute in neuroscience and data science that we do once a year called Neuro Academy that's held at the University of Washington e Science Institute in the summer. Uh, so it's a great time to come to Seattle and, and uh, do, uh, you can see this, this picture captures it all. It's the, the joy and the pain of hacking all in one. And we, we wrote a paper actually uh, published recently in the PNAS about this kind of format where we bring together uh, people from different backgrounds and we do what we call hack weeks. We've done these <coughs> in astronomy, in geosciences, and now also in neuroscience. And the, the format there is very open. It's participant driven and focused on building a community of people uh, provides a little bit more of an on-ramp than the traditional hackathons in which you're assumed to already know how to do everything. Uh, so we think it's a really good format for bringing people in into these kinds of communities of practice. And with that, I will uh, put up my uh, contact information. Please do get in touch. And, uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, questions for uh, First, I have a question. Are you recommending everybody to switch R from Python? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. I think that would make life easier. Uh, so I, I think we can look towards the astronomy community, for example, and what they've done in the last few years. They, astronomy used to be very entrenched in IDL, and uh, their ability to move to Python pretty, pretty nimbly has allowed them to do pretty uh, phenomenal things in terms of the software that exists to do astronomy. 
Uh, no, their software ecosystem is phenomenal. Um, so yes, but but I think using other open source tools is also uh, those those tools are pretty interoperable. So if you're using open source tools, it's not too hard to interoperable. So yeah, I'll, I'll thank you for asking that question. So uh, the, the approach that we're take, we've taken is, is quite different from, uh, the word hackathon is quite loaded, yeah. and we don't necessarily like it, and the connotations that it's loaded with, but we've kind of adopted it anyway, more for the idea that this is, is, is an opportunity to experiment, do something a little bit outside of what you usually do, something small, focused maybe on an attempt to do something quirky and out of the ordinary, rather than the idea. Traditional hackathons, say, in industry are focused on competitive interactions, maybe focused on a particular data set and a particular project that everybody is trying to compete for. We don't do that at all. Instead, we open up the floor and we say, is there something you'd like to do this week with others here? And people write on the board, and then people can join together. It's a terrifying moment for somebody who organizes this kind of event. <laughs> You think nobody will stand up and, and it's like when at the end of the talk with nobody asks a question, right? Uh, but it's worse because you still have five days left to fill somehow. Um, and, and people always do come and propose things. Um, uh, the, the, these hackathons, uh, we pay a lot of attention to how we create an inclusive environment, one that uh, allows people with less technical experience to learn from others and allows people to teach each other things. In the paper we describe, so one of the things, one of the reasons we think it does provide value is that we ask people. And we, in the paper we write a little bit about what, what we asked and what people say. They think of this as a good opportunity for networking with other scientists in their field. So it's, it's domain specific rather than being focused on some technical aspect of the work. Rather it's more, it's focused around neuroimaging in our case. And so there's a community of people that are relevant to you that you work together with. And also people feel that it makes them better scientists in the sense that they're now more able to do their work openly, for example. Because we, we focus a lot on open source tools and our tools to make your research open and useful. So. But I should say the, the paper itself is also includes a long supplementary material that is a recipe for how you might uh, hold a hack week at your own institution. And we'd really like for people to pick that up. We've started developing the, the hack week toolkit will include a lot more like checklists and schedules for when you should do what so that people can adopt this, uh, this format and adapt it to their uh, local school. Okay, thank you. So if no further questions, thanks Ariel. Um, <laughs> now I would like to invite uh, all the speakers from this panel to go up. So now, does anybody have questions for any of these speakers? Is it worth developing all of those standards within different communities and 
even methodologies. I mean, I work in neuroscience, so there's bids and it's specific to MRI, and now they're making all these other kinds of bids, and like, does every discipline need to have 10 different standards that they use? Um, could you help me think through that? So, Anna, I, if you knew how we were going to respond, you wouldn't have asked the question. But, uh, so, so, actually, I mean, I think that's why it doesn't necessarily make sense to make top-down standards, right? I mean, everybody in here has seen the XKCD standards comments, right? And we have people... The microphone away. Oh, oh right. Oh, that is the that come up with uh, really fantastic ontologies and standards, they don't always work. And, and so I think really what, uh, to drive standards development, what we want to do is really put things in the eye of the beholder, right? So the, the correct standard is the one that people will use, right? So, so then if we have a system where uh, people are motivated to share data such that other people will use it, then they will find the standards that make other people use their data. And when data needs to be integrated, they will define the standards that make people, other people integrate their data, therefore widening their audience, right? And so, so I would advocate, actually, a bottom-up approach to say, do you have to check 17 boxes? I mean, that doesn't seem very rational to me if what you want to do is have other people use the data that you were paid to generate. <laughs> Well, this won't surprise you, but I think part of the solution comes from software uh, that makes the data useful, right? So uh, there's sort of a, a way that both of these things kind of meet each other in the middle. Once there's software that makes the data useful, but it's only useful if it's you know, a certain standard, then the standard becomes something that people actually want to use. Uh, so in a similar way, so I think. Um, so to answer your question more specifically, I think, I think there will not be sort of a general standard. I think it right. very much depends on the experiments that people are doing. Uh, all, the, all the experimental fields that are generating today, that generating data today are going to evolve to do different things. And we're going to have the standards that are going to have to evolve with these things. Um, I don't think it's going to be easy, but, <laughs> but worthwhile. <laughs> Sorry, I think. Um, one of the things that, that we all are talking about today is, is data sharing. And data sharing and data reuse are very different things. And um, I think the focus on data sharing is actually detracted from the real question, which is what is data reuse and what is data value? So sharing the data is not useful. Reusing data is <laughs> useful. Valuing data, that is putting value on data is useful. So um, uh, this is sort of a, a blend of these two. Um, uh, we need an operate, we need operational method uh, metadata is. Um, and that operational definition shouldn't focus on the person submitting the data, it should focus on the person reusing the data. Um, and then the second thing is that we need to incentivize it appropriately. And um, there are data sets that we share that have no value. That is, they've never been reused, they will never be reused. And that isn't necessarily because the data themselves are not valuable, it's because we'll never find them. Um, so until we get to a place where we can measure the value, the reuse of data, we won't have the incentives in place um, to uh, make the data more valuable. And uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a process, that's, that's a data maturity process that a lot of companies have already come to. They, they understand that, that uh, if, if they're going, if they have valuable data, the way to make it valuable though is to uh, attach metadata to it. Probably a lot of you have heard of the data, data lakes and data swamps. And what distinguishes one from the other? It's, it's the value of the data valuable is work. I guess the one last piece I would say is that um, metadata um, collection and metadata curation is um, not something for the faint of heart. There are people who do this, they're paid money, they go to school for like 35 years to do it, um, and there's a reason for that. It's very hard to do well. So I think one of the things that as a funding agency we need to spend more time on is figuring out how to get the people who know how to do this in touch with people who don't um, so that we can make things as efficient as possible uh, in terms of data reuse and also in terms of the actual curation process.
standards in like an email pop, I'm not really standard. Okay. I was thinking like uh, IPFS, uh, interplanetary file system, something where there is access that's independent of going to nitrate or the internet zone. There's a, there's a lot, there's a, in, at least in the health, in health related, um, health related research data, um, genomics, imaging, et cetera. There's a, a lot of uh, time, energy, and money being spent on um, uh, indexing of indexes. Um, and uh, uh, I think that we haven't figured out, we as a research community, tell me if I'm wrong, but we haven't figured out what, that, what those, how valuable those efforts actually are. Um, and um, it, it, at some level, we're very uh, early on in figuring out how to do what we're doing. And I would say even in, in the astrophysics community, in some ways further along, um, I think we're still actually pretty immature to really think about these, these data sets. What I, what I try to focus on is, um, is making the data as, uh, making the metadata as um, computable and as accessible as possible. And so particularly when you're talking about tens of millions or hundreds of millions of records, um, if you want to operate on those data to learn from them as opposed to um, search them, um, you need to have uh, uh, those data in interoperable formats, things like JSON. Um, that's not specifying the metadata, but it's pulling it out of this, uh, these uh, APIs that are proprietary and putting it in the hands of people uh, with tools, data science related tools, that make those uh, uh, data much more, the metadata much more reusable. So changing my head a little bit, and, and changing from being a repository person to a, a data scientist, I mean, Really, the format that I can never use is the data that is not there, right? I mean, uh, I was talking with somebody, word to vec exists though. In theory, I can put some gobbledygook you write into a vector and compare it to something else. But if you put nothing there, I mean, if, if you put no, if, if, if the less metadata there is, and, and metadata is usually pretty small. If you put no meta there, data there, then format doesn't matter. There's nothing I can do with it. So I think perhaps as a first pass, just trying to get into this as a community, the emphasis should be putting on putting things in there and then uh, things will fall out. I mean, it, it, there, most data types, I mean, we had a scary discussion of data type this morning. Most data types can be merged in some way into something else. But if, if I'm missing, if, it, if you give me two pieces of metadata, there's only so much contextualization I can do. Any more questions? Can I follow up this? So, I'm kind of reminded to ask this all day, but you guys are the ones up here now, so I'm going to ask it. Because I think you were kind of getting there, there's two different things. Because one, um, so I want to say there's that, you know, like, re Reuse is much better than just sharing the data. But then you're saying it's better just to get the better than just get the data out there. And so this is something that I run into a lot at the moment with researchers because the incentive to exist to spend a lot of time documenting your data. Like they exist for a data scientist to do awesome things. But generally I'm seeing most of the time researchers are sharing a data set because they're publishing somewhere that says you must put this data set somewhere that it has a DOI and link to it. And so there's a tension then between saying, okay, now go back and like document this all and make it beautiful and package it, or like no, just share it and get used to sharing your data and like fix your pipelines so that they're better. I mean, what's the way to get people into this without totally making them spend a month documenting data sets and have their documentation? So, I, I can talk, I, I can attempt to answer this question. So, we get a lot of questions about that for data. And yesterday I got a question about Illumina is using some data set and the data set apparently used enhancers from end to date. The only thing that was there is that it's 450K maximum something. Now, the person uh, contacted Illumina asking which enhancer predictions were used or how they, they were generated. And Illumina pointed out to Encode, like, well, as Encode, they generated these data sets. Now, 
There is no metadata about those enhancers. Nobody knows how they were generated, which software was used to generate those enhancers. And the person ends up with no answer to the question and no data to answer the question. Like, it's really impossible to go back 10 years and figure out how those enhancer divisions were generated. So with no metadata, it's not useful, right? Now, to say that it's easy to <coughs> document everything or we have even defined formats to document everything, we, we don't. But I think that's necessary. Like without that, it's just not useful. Couple of thoughts. Uh, first, you can't have uh, complete depth and complete breadth at the same time, right? You can't have, I mean, the idea that you can have 500,000 data sets and be down to the base pair level uh, or the individual dendritic spine level on every single one of those data sets is somewhat ridiculous and also it's hard to see the use of that. So, I think there are some levels of data where you start to see uh, that sort of clustered indices are more useful. So, um, and, and those we can do with data sets like ENCODE uh, and TCGA that are highly curated and we can bring, bring signal out of there. But that brings me to point two, which is without a lot of information theory work, it's very hard to know what is increasing information density and which directions information density needs to go, where the holes are, that kind of thing. In short, we don't know what is important. There was a discussion earlier about uh, how we won't know what data connections come out of things, right, in terms of uh, personal identifiability. It's, it's very difficult to sort of know the future. Yeah, and it's, it's hard to know a priori what is important in a data set. I mean, what is important to me may not be important to other people in the audience about my data set. So I think there's a space for both. There's a space for clean, harmonized things which we've already established are important, right? And then there is also a space for not so clean, harmonized things, of unharmonized things that may be uh, important in the future. And I think that brings it back to the, the beginning of the point, which is with metadata too, you can't have complete breadth and complete depth, right? If you're gonna give lots of information, lots of content, you can't expect for people to harmonize all of it because it's hard, right? So you can harmonize a little bit of it and then have a whole bunch of gobbledygook that people can sort through if it's important. So my data reuse policy thing is related to um, data that we're paying a lot of money to store, and uh, we're expecting that by sharing it, it's going to be impact. So I'm going to tell a different story, though, which is the story that uh, when I moved over to NCI back in 2007, um, next generation sequencing was literally just starting. We bought the, our lab bought the first sequencer on campus, and for those of you who don't know what next generation sequencing was, it's like um, uh, riding on seen a trickle of water and then immediately without being told you're hammered with the largest wave of data you've ever seen um, overnight um, so we needed a way to, to deal with that and um, what we what we did was uh, it was horrible for the rest of the lab but for those of us who were dealing with the data it was really important um, we established a, a, a laboratory information management system it's pretty simple but the idea is that um, before any data flow to for any samples flow into one of these data generating behemoths, um, we have collected that data. Um, it's time consuming, it's, but, but at the end of the day, what it allowed us to do is to build a, basically a fully automated data management system um, that allows us to see back to 2007, every base of every run that we've done. And um, the way we did that was a technical solution, but the reason it worked was because the PI in the lab said, we're not gonna do it any other way. My, my experts in the lab, my data stewards, tell me this is the way we should do it. This is the way we're going to do it. And um, so what we're talking about here are a lot of technical solutions, but at the end of the day, it's a social contract, really. And um, the incentives can come from lots of different points of view.
but if your boss tells you you have to do it this way, that's a pretty strong incentive. So it's, it's <laughs> worth thinking about that. These are hard problems. They sometimes have easy solutions. Uh, I'll just add one, one more thing, which is there, there, I, when I talk to experimentalists, they tell me that data sharing produces not only is there no clear incentive, it produces disincentives because you're spending years of your life putting, setting up a complicated experimental system, doing the experiments, and then you publish your first paper and then you're required to make your data available for all those people who are sitting and waiting for you to produce this data, so to speak, uh, to, to mine this data. And I think it's perfectly reasonable to require or to allow data environments. Okay? After you've published your first big data, Take a couple of years and mine the data, and then release it. Um, as to why you would organize it in a shareable manner, I think I agree with you, it's like best practices, right? You're sharing data primarily with yourself a year from now. <laughs> you want to be able to go back and mine that data, it better be organized, right? Otherwise, how are you mine? That's pretty simple, but I think the, the disincentive to hard experiments is, is something serious. There's no further questions. Uh, I think we're running out of time. Let's thank our panel. That's, that's, I think, yeah. perhaps something else. 